Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. It's so good to have you here. I'm excited. I'm your host today, Colin Campbell, the Director of Marketing at Sales Hacker. You know me. And today I'm super pumped because we're talking about something that affects, I think, every sales team everywhere. It doesn't matter what you're selling or what industry you're in. And that is basically like time wasters, right? Lack of efficiency. So today's webinar has tips for our salespeople, sales managers, sales ops managers, all the way up to the VPs and the CROs. So um, we're going to talk about all these little places. And some of you might have heard this stat. It's somewhere between like 30 and 40% is really the amount of time that a seller is actually spending selling to prospects. And the rest of that time is, you know, administrative tasks and stuff that really that person wasn't hired to do, um, which is crazy. So uh, we're gonna get into it. We've got seven of the kind of the most overlooked efficiency killers and then some kind of interesting takes. Uh, what I think is interesting about the takes is that we've got some data, we've got some real life stories. So I'm joined by two amazing people with kind of different perspectives on, on the issues here. Uh, one is Adam Becker. He's the chief of staff to the CRO at Conga. Welcome, Adam. Hello. Thanks for joining us. And so for those of us who may not have an intuitive understanding for what chief of staff to the CRO means, can you just tell us briefly what, what you are, what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm uh, employed to essentially help our CRO understand what's going on with the business. Uh, my job is to uh, just understand from top to bottom what's working and what's not and to help uh, keep him informed um, and uh, to help just make sure that things are running day to day. And so I get uh, some tremendous insight into how to operate a business um, and I also get some flexibility to kind of poke around holes and understand um, some of the pain points that are happening, not only at the CRO level, at the C level, but then also uh, down to the individual contributor level. So super excited to be here and talk about things that I've learned along my journey and my career and uh, some things that we're, we're employing now today at uh, Conga. We're psyched to have you. And given that role, we think you have some really uh, like a unique perspective on it. And what's cool, you're joined by Kelsey Briggs. So Kelsey, you're the sales operation manager at Conga. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Yes. Ha happy to be here. Um, yeah, my, my time at Conga, the, the roughly five years that I've been with the company, um, I've been in both a client-facing role, so helping um, hundreds of our customers deploy and adopt and find success with our software tools, um, and served on, a, on the internal side, making sure that our team is the most efficient that they can be and really making sure that we're equipping them with the right tools to be successful sellers. Yeah. There's a breadth of experience between the both of you. We're going to cover this topic from all angles. Um, but listen, two things before I hand the mic over to you. For those of you in the audience who are listening, you joined the live version for a reason, right? Like you don't want to watch the, just the recording and sit there and watch some people talk. You're here because you can interact with us. So right now, go down to the bottom of your screen. You're going to see a Q&A. That's where you can talk to us and we'll answer your questions. I'll take as many as I possibly can <laughs> right there. Um, so let's start by, Pope, open, open that right now. Let's start by doing this. Introduce yourself to us so we know who's in the room and tell us your biggest time waster. Like the thing that if you didn't have to do it anymore, you could spend more time talking to prospects, doing what you actually like, you would make more money, you'd crush quota, you'd be great. Uh, and while you're all doing that, so open the Q&A box, do that right now. While you're doing that and I'm looking at your answers, I'm also just gonna mention, cause I always get this question. Uh, had somebody's a funny person. You, you distracted me. Uh, while you're doing, uh, let me just mention, we're recording this. So if you get interrupted, uh, don't worry about it. If you want to share it with your team, we'll send you all the recording and the deck tomorrow. Uh, so Mackie Bradley says meetings are a time waster. Kristen Prucha, I hope I'm saying that right. You're funny. Uh, says watching videos about how not to waste time is the biggest time waster. Yeah. You get yeah. right into it. You make a point, but hopefully you're here to learn something and you can walk away with some tips and tricks that kind of multiply. Um, Joe Latchaw says manual reports. Mm -hmm. Hear that, Joe. Uh, Victor says he wastes time qualifying sales leads. Welcome, Victor, from Belgium. I think that's the first time I've seen a guest from Belgium. Uh, Sebastian, inefficient prospecting done in Sales Navigator and then copying the process in Salesforce. Mm -hmm. um, spending a lot of time updating Salesforce, creating lists, doing research 
to identify the right contact information. Yeah, so there's all these steps, right? Throughout the whole sales process, we're talking a little bit about prospecting here, but all the way through, there's time wasters. And um, we've got a whole slew of them today. So without wasting any more time, I'm gonna hand it over to Adam and Kelsey. Um, feel free to keep throwing your questions in there or share trip, tips and tricks as, of your own as we go through, and I'll make sure the whole group gets them. Yeah. Fantastic. And thanks so much for everyone's time. And um, as Colin mentioned, uh, I personally like to do things much more interactively. And if you find this content maybe boring or dull, just feel free yeah. to spice it now. All right. Spice it up a bit. Ask some questions. We're happy to uh, answer any questions here. But we do have a lot of, a lot of content um, that we'd like to get through. Um, and what we're going to do is touch on what we believe are, are seven kind of overarching um, areas that we've found just through our own our own histories and talking with one another of uh, areas where we see inefficiencies either in the companies that we've worked for or currently work for or um, since we're kind of in the business of um, selling software and uh, and implementing software that uh, helps solve some of these problems we also as Kelsey mentioned have had the opportunity for many years to be able to talk with our customers and understand their problems as well and so the the seven different areas, I just kind of flip through these here. Um, the seven different areas we're gonna to touch on from a, from a topics perspective today um, are around organizational structure, um, the wrong tech in the wrong places. I think we've already kind of seen some of that today. Um, how to value data in your day-to-day. -day. Um, where can you be automating, taking your digital or documents digital, um, accessing those sales collateral pieces, and then slow and tedious contract negotiations. Um, and, and to kick things off, if you don't know who Conga is, Conga is um, a digital documentation uh, a transformation specialist company bringing software to help solve those problems. So at the end, we'll be diving in a little bit to where our expertise is, do the best job I can to not sell um, any of our own products, but really just talk about some of the problems that, that we believe are, are really affecting not only ourselves internally, but then also uh, many of our companies out there today. Um, so to jump right into it, um, we want to kind of frame up some of the some of the problem. And me personally, I've been in the world of uh, selling software specifically for uh, the better part of, of over 15 years. And I'll tell you right now, in, in 2005, when I first started selling, um, actually marketing software, uh, the world of sales was dramatically different. <clears throat> um, uh, it has definitely changed over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, back 15 years ago, when we were talking about technology. Um, and software, a lot of people were starting to adopt CRM, and that was kind of your one piece of software that you would interact with, Salesforce or Microsoft or whatever it may be. Um, but that was kind of, I actually started on ACT software for anyone who's uh, that old out there. <clears throat> um, but uh, things have changed, and they continue to change. And I think that's what makes this both exciting and interesting, but also is kind of the problem that we're going to be talking about today of how much things have changed about the pace of business, especially in the B2B business has changed and we can continue to see it change. Um, so back in the day where maybe one piece of software today, um, in order just to process an opportunity, um, Gartner says that we see an average of 8.5 uh, number of technologies that are required just to, to process an opportunity. 4.3 uh, different um, uh, individuals on the inside of a sale uh, is, uh, causing more complexity on the way we deliver our solutions. Um, and that's a direct result to the way that buyers have really changed their behavior as well. Um, where when we are thinking about, <clears throat> um, especially more complex sales, um, it takes more buy-in. We have more stakeholders than ever before um, that need to get bought in. And because of that, we have much more complex deal teams. We'll talk a little bit about how we see um, some inefficiencies that come into play with those, uh, with those, those interning internal selling teams and some maybe some tips that we, we found that could help avoid some of those inefficiencies. 16.4% of uh, the sales cycles are just spent on approvals. That's annoying. Um, and overall, 226.1 uh, number of technology touch points per month. So again, kind of some of these big pieces that really add up to what we call burden. Um, we've been talking about this for years now, the seller's burden. What are all the things kind of weighing us down from a salesperson's perspective or sales management perspective, 62%, um, as, as Colin mentioned, the opposite of this, of this stat, 62% um, of reps um, attribute that seller's burden just to complex internal, 
processes. Um, and that's a lot of what we're going to be touching on today from a very foundational level of how we structure a team. And we'll kind of work our way through a little bit more into more specific problems that we see around specifically documents and how we manage documents internally as a sales organization. So we got some interesting points here in the chat and in the Q&A, Adam. Um, first of all, I love that you're kind of pulling back and saying like, look, this is because of buyer trends. This isn't optional stuff anymore. Um, the reason people are obsessed with efficiency is because they have to be. Uh, so Janice from Latvia points out that when you have these inefficiencies, you know, one of the key parts to making a deal is urgency. And we all know that the faster rep a lot of the time will be the one that gets the meeting uh, or the close. And so when you have these delays and inefficiency, it's not just longer time to close, it actually could prevent a close, right? That's right. Yeah. And I think Janice may be looking at our slides ahead of time here. We actually have some stat <laughs> time to close and, and how, how response happens. And, and just to maybe double click into that, um, uh, my world is, is from marketing. So I came from the digital marketing space before I got into sales productivity space. Um, and working with B2C organizations and specifically email marketing as it was emerging. And that's all it was, is being relevant with communications and being fast to respond. Um, and that B2C selling culture, and we, we're all consumers, right? We're all living the B2C world, not from the selling perspective necessarily, but from the buying perspective. Um, I know I shop on Amazon. I think probably at least one or two others um, probably shop on Amazon or other online <laughs> retailers as well. And we've just come to expect, as consumers, we've come to expect that we can do our own research faster. We know what we want more often than not. Um, and we expect to be communicated with in a much more relevant culture. Um, and that kind of influence of the way we've all kind of adapted over the last decade in being consumers um, has really evolved in the way that we must then respond to buyer or to those buyers in a B2B sale from the opposite side. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the water we're all swimming in now. Um, the other point that somebody made, and I think this is just an interesting anecdote, again, from Chris, Kristen, uh, is that she's just pointing out in her experience at Dell and NTT, don't know what that is, there were 20 people or so on an opportunity, as opposed to the average number quoted, which is 4.3. So the 4.3 nice. is, an, is an average. But yeah, in some extreme cases, you have these massive casts of characters working on an opportunity that gets, that gets complex. Kelsey, you're like cringing at imagining how to design sounds, a sales process. That sounds, that sounds hard. <laughs> yeah. But that, that really kind of maybe leads us to our first topic that we want to touch on here, which is um, organizational structure and how it can lead to inefficiencies. Um, and so um, this is probably more for um, the sales managers out there, um, but just some, some ways that we've found of, of how to think through building a team and how to structure teams in a way um, that allows that, that collaboration to happen. There's some, some things that we've learned along the way. Um, and one of the first bullet points here is, is how to build your team intelligently, <clears throat> which means that, um, as we were mentioning, like we have more and more um, selling teams that are happening. And as you're going through and building your team, so actually doing physical interviews and hiring, that's one thing we need to start thinking about is, uh, number one is typically the hiring process is really um, honing in on overall skills. Do you have the skills to be able to, to do the job, whether that's a salesperson's job or maybe a solution engineer? Um, so they have the skills, but then there's a whole nother portion that we think about how those skills fit into a larger team or into the process. And so now as we're doing interviews, not only are, do we need to start interviewing and, and evaluating based upon are they able to do the job, but are they able to fit that job into the process or into the team structure that we intend to build out? <clears throat> and the way, the analogy that I'll use is, is building a house, right? So typically, typically, uh, people who live in the same house together typically get along and, and it makes it very easy, right? If I need to, to work with someone else in my house, I just kind of either shout across the room or go just tap them on the shoulder. <clears throat> um, and that's how we like to think about things, whether I'm building one house, um, the, the, the analogy of a house, um, let's say in the United States, North America, or whether I'm building several houses, what we want to do is have a sales methodology that's cohesive and, and has a team that can feel together like a family and they can work very, very well together. That's, that's what brings on autonomy. Um, and this is one big um, uh, way that we've found some, some efficiency building into our sales methodology is how do, we, how do we make it so that we're hiring the right people that not only can do their job, but know how to do that job as a team. And this is something different we've seen, again, 
if we think back 10 years, um, kind of that, that lone rogue rep used to be able to go and take down big whales all by themselves. And this is not, it's not how you do it anymore. Not in a solution sales um, perspective, whether it's four people or 20 people, um, you need to be able to work cohesively of a team and it's not beholden on those individuals to do it themselves. <clears throat> we as sales managers, we need to build um, the right people, the right processes and set them up for success um, for that internal collaboration so they can work more autonomously. And as we were, Kelsey and I were kind of chatting beforehand, the opposite of a house would be like a hotel where you have badges, we have to go and scan through doors and all those types of things. Um, we want to eliminate that. We want to make it so that, that everyone understands what their roles are, what their responsibilities are, and know that they have the autonomy to go to ask what they need to get the job done. So, so when you think about, like, I think everybody would agree. And a lot of times you hear people talk about sales and marketing alignment because it's so fun to point fingers, but you're basically talking about like sales team alignment. Let's get everybody talking the same language. When you have a big team and maybe multiple locations, what is the process like? What's, how do you actually roll that out and make sure that the reality on the ground is what you dreamed of when you set out to make sure everybody's talking the same language? Well, man, I think if we could all solve that exact problem, we'd, we'd probably all be doing something different. But um, I think, it, I think it, t it starts with the top, right? It starts with getting buy-in, in my perspective, from there, tippity top, is, is we have to agree that this is a sales methodology. Um, and we've, again, for, for some of us that have been through the sales process a number of different times, whether it's Sandler or um, many different sales methodologies out there, um, I personally like to, to find... Um, the right blend that works for us as an organization. Um, uh, as the, kind of the pro tip says here, uh, what worked last year, the year before, likely won't work at our same business next year as, as the pace of change is, is starting to pick up in B2B business. Um, we need to start looking internally and, and start identifying what do we do for our business today rather than ripping a page out of maybe someone else's book. And that really, I think, starts with the, with the top um, understanding what problems are we facing um, how do we address those problems and how do we get alignment from the very top all the way to the bottom? It's actually something that I work on personally um, is setting up <clears throat> whether it's um, our sales kickoffs or whether it's mid-year kickoffs or, or um, meetings where we can have regular times to come together as a sales organization um, and uh, essentially share what's working transparently and what's not. So we're all constantly trying to stay aligned as we're fighting uh, different fires or we're solving different problems, either at a, at a leadership level or at an individual contributor level. I think it's valuable to keep everyone in the loop at the same time. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Max, who you know leads Sales Hacker is my boss, always says, he may have stolen this from somebody, but I always hear Max say, where focus goes, energy flows. So you know, when sales leadership is focused on making sure that the methodology is gonna be the same and they're communicating about it and thinking about it, rather than scrambling around the pipeline, um, yeah, that's where the energy will go. And then the long term, that's what's effective, right? That's right. Except for the last maybe day, day and a half before the end of a quarter. <laughs> then you can start. With exceptions. Yeah. With yeah. exceptions. Yeah. 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 All right. So that was our first um, topic. And then Kelsey, you're going to help talk about a little bit of t wrong tech in the wrong place. I think this one's fun. Yeah. So um, as we start thinking about that one, we've paid your head for me. Um, this is where we want to open up um, a, a poll for you guys, actually, but we want to share with you just a little bit about um, digital transformation, the space that we do a lot of work uh, here at Conga. Um, and for us, uh, digital transformation, um, if it's not a, a phrase or a term that uh, you on the line are familiar with, it's probably something that you've been living every single day uh, for, for at least the last several years. Um, but evolution uh, of business and adoption of technology. So we kind of distill that down into thinking of using modern technology to do better business. Um, we think there's a, a lot of different ways that that's probably playing out at your organization. And I think this graphic kind of probably um, might resonate with folks that are joining us here today, that there's just so many different ways to connect um, pieces of technology that you might be using at your organization. And um, in some respects, there's probably ways to probably really overdo that. We're probably familiar with the phrase shelfware. Shelfware, I love buying shelfware. Um, and, and so, you know, no tech stacks probably um, created equal and taking the time to kind of evaluate that and making sure that you've got the right tech 
in the right places at the right time for the you know the right purpose um, to help you meet meet whatever that mission is that your team's going after um, is really important. So why don't you introduce the poll that we're gonna ask people to participate in? Yeah, and Colin, I don't know how this kicks kicked off, but we just want to understand. Yeah. What, what the uh, term digital transformation, it's, it's kind of fluffy term that's being used a lot of different places for a lot of different meetings, but love to maybe get some understanding of what it means to you. Yeah, so we've got, we'll launch the poll uh, right now. It should pop up on your screen in just a second. And um, hey. you should see it. I'll give you a few seconds to answer this, but basically like, do you know if your organization has a document digital transformation strategy in place and it's okay to not know. Um, I think one of the things that we're thinking about here is a lot of people who are already in tech, like this, uh, I already used the fish analogy, but like fish don't always know they're in water, right? Um, <laughs> happening around you so much that you're not even aware of it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead, some answers still trickling in, but I'm gonna end the poll. So hopefully you can all see the results now. And. I'm surprised. Pretty evenly split. All right. Uh, some of you do have some some DDX strategies in place. Some of you don't know what the hell we're talking about. That's okay. <laughs> we'll try to get around to it. Yeah. So so digital document uh, digital uh, di document digital transformation and digital document transformation DDX um, is a subset of, of digital transformation. Again, still somewhat of a fluffy word, but if if we're using uh, the term digital transformation and, and the way we interpret that um, is just so how we're employing modern technology to just do better business, um, uh, digital document transformation is applying that same technology to the world of documents. So as we get through um, some of these topics, we're actually going to be touching more and more as we work our way to how important that can be and how um, specifically looking at even just document transformation helps bring efficiency and productivity into the space. <clears throat> and maybe to touch on, on how we look at that and how to like even get started in digital transformation, um, what we've done is we put some kind of thought analysis into how do we measure that? Yeah, so I, I like this little graphic just because it, I think it really illustrates that uh, people aren't necessarily on the same playing field. I think that's true with some of the tools that you're choosing to put um, into play for your organization. Um, we do a lot of um, talking and trying to measure a couple key things as we're thinking about how we are making sales reps um, more effective. So one of those that we're talking about today is efficiency. Obviously, we are often measuring that maybe in time, um, thinking about our sales uh, folks doing the right thing. Um, and that pairs hand in hand with uh, how we can help make sure that they're being productive. Um, so focusing on doing the right things. Um, and then I, I think the last piece of that is consistency. So we're able to help them do those things in a really scalable way, things that are repeatable. Um, we're giving them a ball that they can push a hell of a lot farther than a square that kind of you know slides along. Um, so there's, there's definitely um, ways that you can be utilizing um, tools that you're purchasing for your organization to help you digitally transform and make that a selling advantage for you and your organization. Um, so a couple tips here for you would be to make sure that the tech that you are investing in is going to um, be aligning to those core selling activities. And we've talked a lot about um, the buyer and their expectations throughout this selling experience. Um, and those tools that you're choosing um, really have an opportunity to help improve that customer's experience as well. Um, because of the, um, and we just spent a lot of time talking about what consumers expect today, um, those expectations are, are transferring over to the way that they're doing uh, B2B business as well. Um, and then we always say that selling can be both an art and a science. Um, and there, there's a, you know, always going to be a place where those tools can plug into that process to, um, uh, to give you a, a valuable tool to use. Um, but there's, there's still an art to the, the that piece of selling. Yeah, and the way that I interpret that kind of selling as an art and a science, because I, I do, I do definitely abide by that. Is is when we're looking at evaluating technology um, and and aligning it to those core selling activities. The way I always look at this is in the world of B two B sales, it's that human element. It's the it's the person that's the differentiator. You want to have that relationship. You want to build that relationship stronger. And so we don't want to. We don't want to automate it. We don't want to do away. We don't want to use technology to substitute a person per se, 
we want to use technology to take away everything off, right? That burden off of their plate so they can accentuate and, and spend more of their time building that relationship and being more human with the, with the prospect of the customer. So that's where I kind of balance that art and science is, you know, use the, use the technology to give you the science of how to be a better person and how to build better relationships going forward. You know, Sales Hacker has published uh, even recently actually about like how to build a tech stack, what to choose and not to choose, you know, keeping the whole system in mind. We have some checklists, but I actually think they kind of boil down to this. If you answer no to, um, you know, does this tech actually align with the core selling activity? Maybe don't buy it. If you yeah. answer no to, does this tech improve my customer experience? Maybe don't buy it. And I think like, if you can abide by those two things and just make sure that you're, at the end of the day, you're taking a seller, and giving them the ability to be more human and you've kind of got it covered. That's right. Um, and one of the ways that we, we talk about um, and try to identify even internally, how do, we, how do we really get around to identifying what those core activities are um, and what are, what are maybe the areas that we can strip off um, so that they can accentuate those core activities, where can we use uh, technology to help um, is a, a methodology around just doing a time study. And there's no special magic to this. Um, this is a process that we've gone through both ourselves internally, but then also that we've deployed out to um, our, our customers of how to essentially identify where to start. <clears throat> so this is the way we do it um, for one of our sales teams here internally is identifying those core activities, which is prospecting, um, opportunity development, active deal management, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then below that are all of the sub activities that take place under those core selling activities. So there are some of those, a lot of those areas that, that we could automate or we could utilize technology to help, um, to help really remove some of the, the friction there so they can focus on better prospecting so they can actually focus on opportunity development. So again, quick little tip there. I love this so much. Uh, and guys, so I know there's a lot of text here. We'll send you the deck later and you can actually use this yeah. yourselves. Pro tip, if you're a rep and you can't launch a whole time study for your organization, um, don't worry, I've got a pro tip or like a semi pro tip. I did a time study for myself. There's an app, it's free. I'm not you know, plugging it to make money, but it's called Clockify. Uh, you can use it to track your time. So if you find yourself going to your manager, oh, I'm wasting all this time, blah, blah, blah. And they just don't believe you, like prove it, track your time. It'll take you some extra time to do it, but you will walk away knowing without a, beyond a shadow of a doubt how you spent your time for the last like two weeks, um, you'll probably learn something. Yeah, that would actually be super useful if uh, a rep or three came to me with, hey, here's the time study I did it myself. My goodness, I would, I would take that all day long. <laughs> there you go. Heard it from, from the supervisor <laughs> himself. That's right. <clears throat> so, you know, the, the getting into the next point, um, that really leads us down the path of if we can identify some of those areas and we've kind of walked through um, uh, the whole process of setting up the right team for success and all those types of things. Um, now we're in a place to, to really start thinking about where do we, where do we go and, and um, actually start automation. Um, and again, this is kind of the gist. I feel like this is a, almost like a freebie as everyone knows we should be starting to automate things more and more using technology. Um, and, and again, this is kind of an easy one, but, um, the overarching goal of automation is simply to strip out those things that are redundant, um, that are manual work. So, um, one of the, one of the topics or, uh, uh, one of the poll questions at the very beginning of where do you wasting time is, uh, um, putting information or data back into a CRM after you just found it on, on LinkedIn Navigator. <clears throat> um, you know, there's certainly ways to, to automate that and, and, whether that's um, a batch process or whether that's simply going through a, a understanding of different technologies that are out there to solve or to automate, um, you know, there's definitely ways to do that. And those are the, exactly the, the ways or the uh, topics that we should be thinking about automating. Anything that's manual in nature, and especially anything that has data in nature, whereas data entry, we'll actually get to this a little bit later in the deck, um, around how um, if we can automate more of the data entry and reduce overall errors in that data, how much more value that provides us as a business um, by simply automating, reducing that manual burden, not only from someone else typing in, but there's much more business value by not doing that 
and in general. So I'm seeing a theme here um, in between the two of you is I, I think th there's this slide floating around now. I don't know if you've seen it. It shows like all of the sales tech available in the marketplace now, mm -hmm. right? It's like seven, I don't know, several thousand options. And a lot of them have to do with automation. And I think there's this like reactive twitch that people get, like they have a pain point and they go find some tech that can automate that pain point and then they move on. And there's never, first of all, an intentional like study done of how are we actually using our time? Like where is the inefficiency for real? Not just as where it feel, not just where does it feel inefficient? Um, and then actually this, so you're, you're beating me to the punch. This slide is like, and then how do you intentionally from that date point of the data set, you have an understanding of your inefficiencies, like build something that maps to that. Um, not a lot of people do that. People are too like, you know, twitchy. Fix yeah. problems and move Technology on. Technology always fixes everything, right? Just buy it and install it. It works magically. That's how you end up with shelfware. Everyone, everyone has done that. I think at some point in their in their career of just buy something to see if it can solve a problem. And and whether it's poorly implemented or whether it's just never actually set up to succeed and solve that problem, it just sits on the shelf. Um, and as a software vendor, it's like the worst possible thing in the world. Um, we see more attrition of our customers because of of poor or low adoption. At, at the end of the day, if it's not getting used, then, then the typically we're not gonna be renewing that customer. So Sebastian has a good question and I'm gonna put it to the group. Uh, but before I do that, I wanna hear about this process on this slide. Cause I think it's important that we have the right process and the right intention for choosing tools before we talk about Sebastian. Yeah, questions. absolutely. Yeah. I think Kels is the right one to talk about that. Yeah. She's the one who manages this stuff. So, um, I'd say the if, if we're leaving behind some helpful breadcrumbs for anybody on the line who's hoping to implement some of these efficiency killers uh, that you can can be blocking out of your own processes, um, the time study is a great place to start to help prioritize some of these things. But what you're really looking for um, is for the people who have their boots on the ground every single day to be giving you insight into places where they have bottlenecks in their processes. Um, we are, uh, have a best practice to ask um, to really question ourselves, like, okay, at one point this process was important to us, but is it something we can eliminate now or is it something we should try to automate? So not everything is a good candidate to, to for automation. Um, so, you know, asking yourself that question frequently we think is important. Um, and then again, um, taking the chance to kind of simplify the operation of those repetitive tasks. What we've got on the screen here is actually um, the process of mapping out the workflow of some of those processes. And um, I think we alluded to it earlier, but things that worked for your business last year aren't gonna sustain you into the future. So taking um, maybe a quarterly look at some of those processes to make sure that it's still really serving the needs of your business um, can be really, really important and really valuable when you're going through the automation, um, automation process. Yeah, and at the end of the day, um, Colin, I think this is where you were making the point is, um, it's so often where we forget to just measure what what caused the problem to begin with before we go and start implementing some solution. And we see this a lot even in the customers that we're servicing. Um, is that we're going to go in and we're going to do a time study on their behalf so that we can prove that we have value later on. Um, man, it would be nice if, if more people take it upon themselves to kind of, uh, think about this and say, hey, here's the problem I'm, I'm trying to solve and here's the before picture. Um, that's what we do take when we're solving our own problems internally. Um, we do take a lot of those before pictures and Kelsey does a lot of time studies internally um, just to map out exactly that process is. And then we ask, why are we doing this process? Can we just full on eliminate it before we move on to trying to solve maybe a, a automation or, or a productivity problem that may be causing down the road so we can measure that again before and after state so we can then take back to the business and say, when we implemented this process, here's how much value we got out of it, down usually to the minute um, or second in a lot of circumstances. And I think this is why we say overlooked, right? Like, no offense, guys, a time study sounds super boring and dry. Um, what? You're not loving it? What? <laughs> but, but, but because of what it enables you to do, it's really not. But nobody wants, nobody's going to get excited, you know, about doing it, except for maybe a sales process managers, sales operations managers of the world like Kelsey. Right. Um, and the hard thing about it is that when there's a pain, like you're going to say, oh, I would like to do a time study uh, so that we know the before state before we get to an end state. And someone's going to go, no, we have a pain right now. I'm not going to wait two months while you do your little study so that you can have a spreadsheet. I can tell you 
Um, anyway, it's harder than it looks, I think, and this is where the real value is. Let's do something really fun. I think we have the time for this. So for just a quick second, I want to put it to each of you and open it up to the audience. Sebastian Lang asked, which automation tool is your favorite one? That's good. Um, so yeah, let's see. Uh, you guys may have some bias, but I, I, I'd love to hear what the audience has to say. So pop your question answers to that in the Q&A. If you have a favorite automation tool, feel free to share with the group. This is where we do the Jeopardy. Na, na, na. <laughs> Somebody said seamless AI. HubSpot. Maybe you got a few more answers in there. Adam and Kelsey, can you maybe use this as a chance to tell us why Conga is your favorite automation tool? <laughs> uh, sure, absolutely. <clears throat> so. I thought we we're not sure. We're trying very hard not to pitch anything, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I clearly we're a bit partial here, but when, and we'll get to a little bit more around the pain of just documents in general and how the life cycle of a document goes from creation to processing um, to closure, uh, depending upon which document we're talking about. But um, when we take a look at automating the full on life cycle of a document from the creation of getting the right content in the right place, delivering that content out to the right person at the right time, and then taking action uh, based upon the behavior of what's going on with that document. Um, it, it would be uh, it'd be hard to beat Conga in the way that uh, we're able to deliver the full suite from all the way to creation through closure um, by giving you insight of how to do better about your business uh, across every document that's generated within your business. It's, it's a pretty, pretty cool tool. Yeah. I think it's, and again, the reason why I think it's exciting is because it's, it's an overlooked area for a lot of people. Sebastian, I'll throw one out for you that might help you solve your specific pain point of taking that sales navigator to Salesforce issue. Um, lead IQ is pretty good for gathering lead data. Um, all right, we got a couple other answers. Let's move on though. That was a fun game. Thanks for playing along yeah. everybody. So uh, I think we'd be remiss if in, as we're talking about efficiency killers, we don't spend just a minute talking about data and the value that you can put on that in the day-to-day. -day. Um, we've got a stat that uh, over half, it's 61%, actually 61% of managers have trouble getting insight into opportunities. And we're coming up you know, tomorrow on the end of the month. And I just know that all across the globe, there are managers sending text messages and chatter and IMs and you know emails to check in on the status of deals, um, and so this absolutely you know points back to the things we talked about earlier. The sales methodology you're going to deploy for your team's processes, um, the way that you're going to help set up automation for them, um, even the tech stack that you're choosing for them. Um, but as we're thinking about uh, data at your organization, really that for your team that that's gold. And in some cases, you might have to do a little bit of mining to make sure that you can be accessing useful pieces of data. Um, but we've really found and, and found the most success when we have an organization and leadership and a team that buys into understanding that data integrity is really a shared responsibility across the organization. Um, so that that becomes something from the, from the rep level who might be you know, touching that data point with a manual entry if that's necessary, um, but rolls up all the way to be valuable data um, to you know, the C-suite who's looking on that to make, uh, make decisions for the business. Um, and we've said it before, but consistency really matters. Um, use automation. Um, but when you can be uh, taking uh, pieces of information that your team is touching, giving them a scalable way to touch that, um, and giving your business uh, scalability in the way that you can report on that, um, you're going to be giving yourself, quote unquote, better gold that you can be relying on. Adam, you told me a little story yesterday about how you're trying to separate the human element from your own uh, business analytics, uh, sales yeah. reporting data. Can you tell us a little bit about like, I mean, it's different for every organization, like you said. So what are the specific challenges you all have faced? How are you overcoming that? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, it kind of gets back to the point of even automating like leads into the system. It's at any, any given point in time where we're having humans um, touch our data, um, whenever we have any level of manual entry, that, that is just room for error, room for um, inaccuracy. And so um, what, what we're talking about is uh, the more that we can get it so that it's, in a, it's a much more efficient process, which is a big, big value for all of you reps out there. Like you don't want to be just plugging in information, double typing those things in. Um, you want those things to happen automatically, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a logging in email, whether it's you know, registering a lead, all of those types of things there's some method generally out there to be able to solve that, um, to get them into a core data set um, automatically and reduce overall error. At the end of the day, um, what that means is that gives us trust in the data. When we can, when we can physically and, and, and know kind of the bottom of our hearts that this data is trustworthy, that allows us um, to do much, much more with it. It allows us to paint a much better picture, not only for the C-suite, which are, it's clearly is very important, but but also down to the individual rep level. Um, a lot of things that we're doing internally at Conga for our own sales reps um, is we try to expose out to them just as much about their own business um, as we try to expose for our C-level um, about Conga as a whole. Um, and so I always coach our, our reps as, as you know, own, own your business. We, we build out our um, sales methodology based upon territories. So any one sales rep may own you know, three or four states um, and we want them to, as we mentioned in one of the earlier slides, we want them to act autonomously. And so we want to give them, we want to supply them with as much information as they need in order to run their business and run those states as best as they see fit. We trust them. We want to trust them. Um, and we want to give them all the tools that they need um, so they can manage and run that business. The only way we can do that is by, is by automating it and, again, getting trustworthy data into the hands of, of them and in the hands of everyone else along the way. One of the things that, uh, again, Kristen pointed out is that her last three companies, leadership never actually just checked Salesforce for updates. They were doing the chatter thing that Kelsey was talking about earlier. Yeah. It's a chicken and the egg thing because what happens is the leadership will try to check. The rep hasn't put their information in manually, and mm -hmm. so they have to ask the rep. Um, so it sounds like what you're doing is avoiding, it saves time on both ends, right? If the, if the information goes in automatically, then there is no asking because the leadership knows that it's going to be in Salesforce if it happened. Yeah. And this is, I mean, this is a problem that's like everywhere and it probably won't ever go away. Um, and in my opinion, um, uh, it's, it, you know, the, the management needs just as much training, if not more training on how to trust the data that as, as individual reps do. Um, and it just takes time. I know that we've implemented a, a, a tool recently for pipeline. I know that was one of the items that came up at the very beginning called Clary. Um, and it's taken us a number of months to get that implemented. Um, but now that we're finally getting what I say, trust, 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 trust. And it's something the banner I've been carrying for a couple of months now is we got to trust this stuff. Um, and now we're starting to see that um, not only are reps starting to get their data cleaner. Um, so there's some things you simply can't automate, like what the stage of the opportunity is, what the forecast category is when it comes to pipeline management. <clears throat> But um, by using tools that are associated with that data and by leveraging those tools, and we share this back out to our sales reps, we show them exactly what we're looking at from a management level. Um, so we're trying to be extremely transparent to show, to show them we're not, you know, we're not going to go in and poke holes in every single deal, but um, because of you and managing your deals better, um, it gives us the ability to, to use um, some of the more modern technology that has AI implemented into it and things to that effect. Um, that leverages all those data. So again, um, kind of touching on some of these bullet points here, um, it's, it's really around um, removing those roadblocks um, so that it doesn't take time for people to, um, to build their own reports. What we wanna do is we wanna, we wanna share the, the correct reports with the correct insights for the correct people from a centralized location. Um, so it's something that we do. We share our reports from the top to the bottom um, and, uh, and again, we, we also try to do analysis on, on behalf of a lot of individuals so they don't have to take the time to do so. Um, at the end of the day, if you have good, clean data that you're starting to get um, your hands wrapped around, that's what all those technologies leverage at the end of the day. Um, so anything that, let's say, like for example, Salesforce, most people probably use some version of Salesforce. If it integrates with Salesforce, it's integrating with that data. 
Um, and the better the, uh, uh, that data integrity is, then the better those technologies will work. Full circle. Yeah, so pro tip, uh, the, if you haven't yet figured out how to make your data right or as right as possible, it's never gonna be perfect, maybe tacking on solutions that depend on that to automate actions isn't going to work. That's correct. Cool, Somewhere. all right, <laughs> love that insight. All right, <clears throat> and by the way, um, quick, quick uh, research study that the people who are able to leverage that, again, it's not like just turning on a technology, like you said, Colin, um, I think a lot of people are like, oh, this will fix all of my problems. Um, but we spent, we spent probably a solid year um, just getting our data into a place that allows us to leverage those technologies. So that is the hard lift as getting the data set. Um, but once you do, um, it's, it's very easy to start seeing um, a lot of the advantages come out because of how little you have to mess around with a core data set and can start worrying more about what, what the technology is telling you and letting that technology work for you. Oh, this is a fun one, the pro yeah, tip. The uh, last pro tip for this section is um, uh, something that we're trying to do um, any time that we put together maybe a report or a dashboard for an area of our business, and that's go through just a little bit of a conversation and an exercise to figure out what that North Star is for that group. Um, our pro tip is the way we like to read our reports or our dashboards is to um, have that tell a story across the screen for somebody. So we put that North Star, whatever that metric is, maybe that key KPI for that organization who's going to be viewing that dashboard. We put that in the top left hand corner so that helps tell the story um, across that dashboard page. Um, for us, when we're saying North Star, um, it's really an exercise of um, going through a process to understand what, what key KPI key KPIs for that group might look like, and then what that guiding light might be um, as we're kind of trying to align all of our efforts towards um, kind of focusing on and improving and meeting and, you know, getting to that, uh, getting to that key, yeah. key, key KPI. Key, key, key KPI. Uh, so as an example for the dashboards we built for individual reps, um, we put their month, amount of dollars they've sold. That is their key key. <laughs> key KPI, you did it to me. North Star. Key, yeah, North Star, or, and that's in the upper left-hand corner of their dashboard that we built for them. So every time they go in and look at their individual dashboard, they know exactly where they sit for to quota. That is the first thing we need on their mind and the last thing they need on their mind. Right. right. So that they're not all over the place trying to think about how many calls have I made, how many emails have I sent, have I followed up on that contract yet? It's really just, there's a dollar amount here. That's right. That's where you start and you can always get to those more detailed of how you get to more dollars. But at the end of the day, it's always good to start with that North Star in mind. All right. So you've got uh, two more sections and I want to make sure we get through them both in the next uh, 14, 12 minutes or so. Yeah. Because um, these are like hyper tactical. I think these are some areas where people listening can actually walk away too with things to do differently starting tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. And so again, this is getting into more of our areas of expertise. Um, and the first thing we'll frame up is what, why documents, because it's not necessarily the most sexy thing in the world to work on. Um, but um, it's really important. At the end of the day, when we, when we start thinking about, um, you know, how can we go and help businesses evolve in the realm of digital transformation, the concept of digital document transformation really came out as, um, as something that, that uh, most people don't necessarily think of as tremendously important, but at the end of the day, um, after you start thinking about it, it's really underpinning um, everything we do from a sales organization. So think about it this way. Most people are going through some level of a sales process, you know, starting with discovery, going through sales stages, blah, 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 blah. Um, when you start thinking about what are the what are the things that help you transition from stage one to stage two, stage two, stage three, um, most of the sales processes that we see um, move stage to stage with a document at the end of it. So, quick example: the stage proposal. Proposal stage is a pretty typical stage in most people's state, uh, uh, methodologies. At the end of a, pr a proposal stage, I need to be delivering a document out to my prospects that has maybe information about the company, pricing, whatever it may be. Um, but we kind of think about that at the end of every sales stage, um, whether it is a piece of collateral, whether it is a contract, whether it's that proposal, whether it's a quote, whatever those things may be, oftentimes um, 
B2B business builds their stages around a document that is shared information back and forth. And that's just on the sales, um, uh, within the realm of sales. And then we start thinking about HR, we start thinking about um, legal, we start thinking about many other things. Um, there's a tremendous amount of documents that get exchanged from a vendor to a prospect to a customer throughout the entirety of their life cycle. And every single one of those documents has to be built. It takes content. And I, we've already talked about the more, uh, uh, more relevant we can make that content for the recipient, the more likely they are to interact with it. The faster we can do it, the more likely they are to take action on it, so on and so forth. These are just really plays that marketers have been doing for years now um, that we're just now applying to the world of sales documents specifically here. So what it really means, and we, again, we, I mentioned we're gonna get around to this, but um, it is very well proven that these things work. Um, when, we, when we talk about um, uh, win rates based upon response rate, um, uh, insurance comes to mind. I know we work with a number of different insurance companies and getting um, essentially quotes out with uh, their insurance rates um, the 50% uh, or sales are one is actually low in the insurance industry. It's, it's much more like 75% of the person who simply responds the fastest wins the business. And what it takes to, 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 to get essentially get that is we have to get the right, the right understanding of who that individual is. I need to send to it. I need to combine all the information into a document. I need to have that prepared with a signature, blah, 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 blah. That list goes on of the requirements just to build a document, let alone send it out to them. Um, and again, that's, those are things that we, we certainly can help with. Um, and then again, getting uh, to who responds fastest and the preferences of those uh, recipients of those documents, that's just understanding it. And we've already talked about the importance of data. So the more data that we have about an individual that's captured likely through the discovery process, the more rapidly and the more accurately we can respond back with either collateral um, or, or quotes or whatever it may be, whatever those documents may be. Um, so again, faster and smarter um, literally leads to more business and it doesn't get more streamlined than that. Um, and then you add in along the way the ability to get insight into how recipients are responding to those, are they looking at things, um, simply gives you as a seller more information to be able to pick up the phone and know that you're being top of mind um, so that you again can be responsive and be relevant in the communications you're giving as a human um, to your prospect or to your customer. So super important. Um, certainly so, to, to talk about that. Yeah. Kelsey, you, when we were talking yesterday, you threw out a stat that blew my mind and it actually it was about this topic, finding mm -hmm. sales collateral. Can you throw that out again? Yeah. Uh, it takes one to five days for a sales rep to, to find ROI related sales collateral. And that's, so that's based on, uh, oh, is that responses from your time study? No, no published that out there. That's so crazy to me. It's not one to five minutes or hours, one to five days. Um, so yeah, so when we talk about speed and slash efficiency, just having your collateral as a type of document, like having your collateral in one place is, when you think about documents are the things that move a sale, the collateral is one of those documents and it's a place of inefficiency. It blew my mind. Yeah. I don't know about you guys in the audience, but one to five days is crazy. Yeah, and so that actually, great segue into this last um, last couple sections here that we're, we're gonna talk about a couple tactical things that you can be doing with your the documents that help your sales reps close business. Um, so we've got that, um, we know that not only does speed matter, um, that fast response time can help you win. Um, it also takes a long time for sales folks to be finding the right collateral, but that content's really important to those B2B buyers. 75% of them are say that that's extremely influential in choosing one vendor over another. Um, so I can tell you as a sales operations manager, I'm working with hundreds of our customers to deploy their own sales documents that they are definitely not all created equal. Um, being polished really helps you stand out um, and being able to enable your sales team to provide those documents with a quick turnaround time is also going to make you stand out in that sales process. So a couple of the things that we just wanted to share with you um, are four often forgotten things that you might need to close business. Um, we found that these are often really important to people who are making buying decisions and taking some time um, before 
before it comes up as a request to make sure that these are available for your salespeople. Um, and, and again, put together in that polished way, probably approved by marketing um, and in a repository where they can easily get to them and provide them to that customer is gonna be setting your team up for success. Um, and, and hopefully waste, you know, taking off the table a lot of that wasted, wasted time, wasted efficiencies. Um, so those four key areas, I'll just give you a couple ideas of what you might be sharing in these are proof points. Um, so this would be a spot to do professional customer testimonials. If you can do any sort of customization and even use some of the data that you have to make sure that you're providing the appropriate industry or persona or um, product or service. Um, so that's really relevant um, and helping them understand, you know, how that resonates for them so that uh, they can understand how you'll be a trusted advisor for them. In the reliability and support arena, um, that one's really about helping them understand how easy you are to do business with. Um, and metrics can be really important there. So um, that's a great place to show off um, your leading response times or your five-star customer reviews. Um, security and compliance is one that I really do think is often forgotten. What we hate to see is when we're leaving it up to, um, you know, an eager sales rep to put together some important language about your business's stance on some of those important topics, um, rather than asking, you know, the appropriate team to kind of put that together, approve it, and make sure that we've got that um, in an area where we can come back to over and over again and be, be providing that approved content. And then finally, don't forget that, um, really in the sales process that all of this content that you're putting should, together should be helping build trust. Um, that piece of the experience is more important than ever. Um, and we've really shifted in, in the uh, terms of needing to provide that relationship with the customer. Um, so don't, don't forget that that needs to come through in all of the collateral that you're putting together. And the final piece that we'll leave you with mm -hmm. is about um, maybe your contracting process. I think, again, this is another pretty staggering stat about how long it can take to, um, for a contract to be created and approved, 3.4 weeks. Um, of course, this is going to vary by business and probably by industry, um, but that's a lot of time. And oftentimes, a lot of those internal processes can be slowing things down for, um, for your sales rep or for that customer on the other side. So a few things that we have uh, here as suggestions for you to empower your sales team with a self-serve model would be taking some time to consider how you can put together some pre-approved terms that will allow your reps to negotiate with confidence. So if, if uh, we do need to deviate from, uh, you know, the approved MSA language, what is an approved, um, you know, chunk of language that we uh, are okay with our sales team uh, using to negotiate that deal faster. Um, think about ways that you can control versions of those documents and maintain security um, and compliance with those. Uh, and then there are tools out on the market that can give you better insight into buyer's behavior with the way that they're interacting with your documents. So you can keep that deal momentum alive, um, you know, be following up at relevant times and gaining some insight into uh, areas of the document that they maybe have concerns or are really interested in um, discussing before you might move that deal forward. So I know you said, you know, the documents aren't sexy, but I think that's what makes it such an effective area to improve upon because nobody else is going to be excited about doing it. And if you're the person among your competitors who chooses to, you know, fix that inefficient part of your sales process, um, it's going to have big benefits, right? I also love the idea of like the unsexy, again, the unsexy idea of doing a time study so that you actually know before and after, did you make an impact or not? It's the little things like these kind of wonky, like sales nerd things that your competitors are going to be missing, but because you're a sales hacker community member, you're going to be doing, um, of course, you all are going yeah. to do this stuff. Yeah. Um, There's no, no silver bullets things. out there. You got to grind it out. <laughs> yeah. And to your point, Adam, it's like, it's really, you know, organization specific. So you have to do the hard work for yourself. That's right. Uh, well, I don't know what you, oh, you got That's it. Left. That's it. All right. So to summarize, there's a lot of different places that are inefficient. Think about your sales process and all of the areas there. Do a little audit, do a time study. Uh, in particular, pay attention to documents because a lot of people might not be. And that's like a secret way to speed things up. 
Um, thanks for stopping by everybody. It's been so ha fun having you around. Thanks for the interaction and the questions. Great stuff. Shout out to Christian and Sebastian, um, Adam and Kelsey, special thanks to you. Appreciate you stopping by. Thanks so much, Colin. Thanks everyone. All right. We'll see you around. Come back for more uh, sales hacker webinars. We do them twice a week. Bye everybody. Bye.